Hello, I'm retired Battalion Chief Larry Cockman from the Greensboro, North Carolina Fire Department History Book Committee. We're here today at the Greensboro Historical Museum. I'm standing in front of the General Green, the first steam pumper, or as they called it back then, a steamer. Today, December 9th, 2019, we are starting a new tradition of recording and preserving the heritage and culture of our retirees. Our retirees have contributed so much to the success of our great fire department. Their stories retire with them and are sometimes gone forever when they pass away. They will share their emergency calls that will always be a part of their memories forever. So sit back and listen as they carry us through their journey in the Greensboro Fire Department. Full name is Woodrow H. Parrish. 38 years. Age 77 and rank at retirement was captain. Before I joined the fire department, actually I was uh, looking for a job. I had just gotten out of the Marine Corps. I had been away from home for 30 months of my four years. This duty that I was on required you to be gone for 30 months. And so uh, it was not home at any time during that. That was part of the, the, the job. And when I came back, all my friends were gone. Uh, my buddies that I grew up with and uh, played around with were all gone. And so really just uh, looking for a purpose in life. And uh, my mother and Chief Warwick's wife were good friends and they had a little sewing part uh, party at nights. Mom worked with the Bates Nightwear and uh, she would bring material home. And she and Miss Wyrick would sew. Well, during this time, Mom mentioned to Miss Wyrick, I wish he could find a job. And so she said, have him go see Moon tomorrow morning. So actually, uh, Miss Wyrick hired me, not Moon Wyrick. <laughs> so I went down the next day and was hired. It wasn't a waiting period or nothing. He, that gruff voice of his, be here in the morning. And so I was here in the morning and went to work. He told me, he said, be here tomorrow morning. Next morning I went <clears throat> to Dr. Gilmore, got my physical, came back and went to work. They suited you up for uh, turnout gear and gave you a couple uniforms to wear. And uh, I was told to follow Monroe Nicholson. He is your person that's gonna be training you. You do everything that he does. And Monroe was a character those of uh, the other guys that have worked with Monroe know. And I remember Chief Ritter, Captain Ritter at that time, telling me, don't do everything Monroe does. <laughs> so, uh, Monroe, whatever he did, I did. Wherever he went, I went. And uh, there was no process. And once you stayed on long enough to, uh, to get a uh, training class, then they, uh, would send you to the training class. I was on six months before I ever went to training. So then we were taught, forget everything that we have tried to teach you. Let them teach you anew. Because if you go out there saying, no, this is the way we do it on the line, then uh, that was a bad thing. So okay. there was no process per se other than uh, never did. Never even had a desire to be one. And uh, I guess the best friend that I've ever had in my life told me about it. And uh, he, was, he had been on a couple of years. And it was ironic because every word that he worked, I worked. And uh, so I was Jesse Gray, Jesse Carl Gray. My starting salary was $362 a month. Uh, if memory serves me correctly, about a month, two months maybe. Uh, actually, we tried to play it close to the vest. We were not going to do anything to jeopardize uh, uh, 
losing this position. So we didn't joke around a lot. Uh, nothing funny, but a couple incidences that happened and I've shared with, in, in light of the fact that they've recently torn down the tower, of the time that the uh, hose blew, we were practicing advancing the hose up the back side, uh, up on the 50 foot ladder, and I was on the nozzle. And I threw the nozzle off of my shoulder onto the floor and hollered for the water, and when they turned it on, the nozzle, the, the hose blew right in my face. Knocked my helmet off and sent it flying back towards the railroad track knocked me out and I remember waking up and Chief Powell having my coat and the water spraying in my face and he said, hold on, hold on. Of course, I was locked in. I wasn't going anywhere. But that was the closest thing to being funny. I mean, it was uh, not funny, but a memorable event. Riding out of Old Central and when uh, um, Major alarm would come in. Every truck in that station would go down the streets, one right after the other. You had two engines, two ladder trucks, a chief's car, and maybe a salvage unit. All that noise reverberating, echoing off of the walls, the canyons of the city, you might say, and the people looking. And you could tell in their eyes they were proud of the people, what they were doing. And uh, it made you feel proud back that you were doing something worthwhile. Captain uh, Eli Ritter. Okay. Driver was John Nicholson. On the back was Monroe Nicholson. No relation, I don't think. Uh, I think uh, A.B. Kimball may have been on it. Okay. And myself. Graham Fuqua was the one that assigned nicknames to people, and usually they stuck throughout. And uh, he never did sign me one, so I don't know if that's a good thing or bad thing. <laughs> Some of my funniest moments was uh, actually with your brother. He and I lived within a quarter of a mile of each other. And we had, I would drive one week and he would drive a week. And we had a standing rule that if I wasn't in his driveway at 20 minutes to 8, he was coming to get me because he knew I was sleeping in and vice versa. And the times that we would have just going to work, his wife would get make us an egg sandwich and a cup of coffee, and I'm coming running out of the door half dressed, jumping in that truck of his, and him flying up the road and me spilling coffee all over me. And I, we just, you'd have to be there just to enjoy the moments. And uh, we had a code. One meant abandon all safety law. Run red lights, run stop sign, run anything you want to, to get to work on time because uh, there was a penalty to pay if you were late. And one morning, one morning uh, Raymond ran a, not a stop sign, maybe a caution sign, a uh, caution light. Sheriff's deputy pulled in behind us. So we pulled into the lot. We knew we was two minutes from being late. And Raymond jumps out of the truck, hollers at the sheriff, start writing your ticket, I'll be back and sign in a minute. We can't be late. And so we go barrel through the door. <laughs> so things like that. Raymond and I would have more fun going and to work and coming home from work, and a lot of people would at a, at a circus or something. It was just a ball to know that guy. The union was active during this period, and uh, yes, I was a member. I remember uh, we all resigned in mass over something. I can't remember the year. Uh, we weren't happy with either the hours or the pay or whatever, and we were coached into resigning in mass, which we all did. It was at the old fireman's uh, club, and I'm sitting next to my captain, and when he signed the paper here, he'd been on many years, and I hadn't been on just a year or two. I said, well, if he signs, I'm certainly gonna sign it. And so we did, and uh, get a couple weeks later, Moon Wark, he came out on the floor, and he gave us one of the best but chewings that you ever heard in your life. He dared us to resign. Throw your stuff in the floor, he said. I'll fire every one of you right now today and have people off the street doing your job. I dare you to quit. And so, you know, here's the chief of the department daring us to quit. And I'll never forget that. I'm thinking, oh Lord, what did I do? But uh, like I could say I'd been on a year, and these other guys been on many years, and uh, yeah. 
At Old Central, we had 20 some guys and uh, yeah, you'd take, each company would cook for two days, or I think it was. We was one day on, one day off, one day on, one day off. So I think you cooked for the week. In, uh, no, absolutely not. <laughs> like no bones about it. We are. Uh, <laughs> I'm like, he's got it out before I can get it out. Absolutely. Um, Still feel that way. <laughs> I was taught by uh, Otis Summers, who was a very good cook. And I would tell him, I said, I'd pay you, Otis. I'd say, I'd pay you if you'll cook for my, my two times. He would never take money. He would cook for me or help me. He said, learn to do two meals. Learn you two good lunches and two good suppers and rotate them around. So they don't remember what they had the day before. And so naturally the old firehouse, pinto beans, cornbread, slaw, was, a, was a lunch and baked something, either pork chops or chicken for supper. And he would help me until I finally got two meals that wouldn't poison you. <laughs> I hate to keep going back to Old Central because that was probably my most fondest. Now, every, everywhere I've worked, I've been so blessed in the fire department. I can't say I've ever had a bad assignment, a bad company, or a bad supervisor. I've thought the world of all of them. But Old Central will always stand out. If you've worked there, you, you don't have to be explained. It. But we had one table at the back. There was two tables, one the long one that would sit maybe uh, 15 people and wanted to back sit maybe six or seven. We'd have eight or ten around that and called the trough. And the things that went on at the trough, oh man, it was just unreal. If you happened to spill your tea, everybody knocked their tea over. It was standard. You pulled, and then you dumped, dumped your plate upside down. I mean, it was just things like that. We had a bucket that hung from the pipe uh, of the kitchen. In the kitchen there was a pipe that ran across the thing and it was actually catching the drippings out of the bathroom right above us and so if you had a biscuit if you threw it up into the bucket that exempts you from having to wash dishes you know and so yeah that bucket would just stay full of uh, biscuits or whatever until <laughs> we finally had to <laughs> empty it but uh, yeah, things people stealing uh, J. Lewis's chocolate milk and him getting tired of it so he would doctor it up with egg slacks you know Things like that, didn't I? <laughs> <laughs> Firecrackers with butter, yep, yeah, that was a. Well, uh, somebody have a birthday, and when it would be known, oh, your birthday, yeah, yeah, well, somebody eventually would have a firecracker in their locker or something, and stick it in the butter and light it. So you have butter all over the wall. I mean, and the captains, bless their hearts, they were good guys, or they should have locked us all up. <laughs> Uh, actually, when I was promoted in Census Station 7, I didn't want to sleep in the captain's room. I wanted to sleep with the guys. You think you're missing something. We had such a camaraderie. and uh, uh, So dormitory living to me, it brings you closer together. You, uh, you're sharing each other's cough germs and all this stuff and whatnot. But uh, Yeah, I, I've never had a dorm, I mean, a, my own private quarters until I got promoted. Like I say, it took me a while to get adjusted to that. And really never did, actually. I'd rather be with the guys. In our day, and a lot of this was going back when, uh, when I rode the back of the truck, uh, we were always together the following day doing something with another firefighter, either helping him with a house project or playing golf, which I never was any good at golf, but I'd go play. Uh, yeah, we just seem to be closer in the, the older days. Now, these days, I hear people, when they retire, they say, well, it's just not like it used to be. It ain't like it was when you was on. I'm thinking, well, how did you know you wasn't on then? I mean, these are your good days, and make the best of them, because you're going to look back and tell a new man that's coming on right behind you, uh, you know, you're living in your best days. Because you feel like you have been disconnected once you leave and you stay gone for a while. You go back, you don't know the people anymore. You can have a guy that's been on 
20 or 30 years to go into a station and have to introduce himself. And he may have been the chief when he retired. I've heard one of them say that, that when I went in, they, can I help you, sir? Well, yeah, he knows right then that they don't even know who, who he is. And, uh, if the guys would just uh, take the time with them, I mean, maybe their interests are different. Right now, I understand they sit with their smartphones and all of them are using their smartphones and the, they don't even talk to each other. So how should we expect them to talk to some old goat like myself when I go in? Well, that, it, this is not just my observation. The guys, uh, the ones that I hang around with now a lot uh, when we're out fishing and whatnot, and one that just recently retired, Bo McMaster, is a very good friend of mine. And, he said, this is not like it was when y'all was on or when we was over at Old Seven. They, they just don't, uh, it's more with that cell phone, with the social media. And where we were having something going on all the time, like peanut butter, I mean, uh, the butter and the firecracker fights or something going on with the, between the guys. And uh, I think they, uh, maybe it's just the time. I know old Captain Scott, before he retired, he would always find me at, wherever I was, he'd come out to Station 10, and the guys would say, who is that old man anyway? I said, old man, <laughs> he's one of the best renowned firefighters of the time. And I said, he, he worked for many, many years, and uh, yeah, I said, he had some interesting stories to tell if you just take the time and listen to him. But you know, they're, they've got their own interest and whatnot, and uh, I understand it, I understand. Oh, I remember my first fire, uh, first call, yeah, I had a first hydrant that I caught and all this, but uh, yeah. church in Leftwich, one of those big two-story houses, and it was a mattress fire, and uh, I remember, and this was after coming out of training, I knew what I was supposed to do the, the proper way, and uh, when Captain Ritter gave me the signal to catch the hydrant, you know, I said, oh, Lord, I hope I got this down right, because, uh, you know. We had an old rescue truck. Well, actually, rescue one out of Central and rescue two, or, or rescue two out of Central, I believe, and one out of five, and I think that was it. I, I'm not sure. But actually, uh, if it was a bad call, the ambulance would, would call to Central and tell Chief O'Hark or Chief O'Shea or whoever, hey, I need a firefighter, or I need two firefighters. We got a bad wreck somewhere. And we would actually be standing out on Green Street and they would come by in the old hearse ambulance and pick us up and go to the scene. Uh, but later on, when we rescue uh, two, I'd ride that on, you would rotate around when, you, when your uh, time come to ride rescue two, and we would answer wrecks, uh, drownings, things of that. Never did have much medical per se like they do now. Of course, we didn't have the training, EMT. When I got promoted, I was sent to uh, Station 7 on Truck 4. And uh, shortly thereafter, they started the squad concept. And they wrote all the medical calls. And I was glad of that because medical calls, I think that's a, you've got to be cut out for that. And uh, I wasn't. It was hard to, to uh, do the medical calls and whatnot. Being there as quickly as you can be there. For medical calls. Oh, for medical calls. Uh, once we started the EMT concept and you became an EMT and you learned the values of uh, CPR and the uh, six minute, I think, you got to have something going mm -hmm. within that period or you're gonna lose your patient. Yeah, and you, uh, if you're right next door or two doors up from the call, why well, wait for an ambulance who may be four or five minutes or longer away? And so, yeah. Well, the big one I was never on. I saw it in the paper the next morning, and I remember looking at the paper thinking, gosh, my, New York again, but it was actually downtown. Uh, I guess the biggest fire would be the, for me, would be in the Rhodes Firehouse. It was down on Davy Street also, but uh, nothing to the magnitude of the, the big one, if you will. Well, I guess the biggest one in my mind was the worst one that I never wrote on, and that was the night that we lost Jesse in uh, December of 1969. Uh, 
he and I were sitting like you are right now with us just talking in the locker room, discussing what we're going to do the next day when the call come in. And I said, well, go, right, uh, go on down, wind your box. We had the old fire alarm boxes on the streets, you know. And I, come on back. I said, I'm going to be in bed. Well, we know he didn't come back. But when I laid down and I could still hear Paul Brown in a panic, panicky voice, Santa help, we've ran over somebody. We've ran over a man. And I don't know why a light went off. And I knew it was Jesse for some reason. I knew it was Jesse. And I, but anyway, that was the, the worst, beyond a doubt, the worst fire I ever experienced. To see the, uh, just to see the buildings collapsing. We were on duty and I uh, can't remember who it was come in there and said, a plane just ran into the World Trade Center. And so naturally we went and flipped the TV on and there it was. And then we were just drawn to it. And then the next thing, here comes the other plane and then we knew right then that it was terrorist. Uh, but how did it affect me? when those towers collapsed and you could hear the, the beeping of the air packs, you knew those beepings was the guys that, uh, they were gone, you know. And, uh, and then the patriotism of this country, the way we came together after that, briefly, you know. You did not want to be an enemy of the United States after 9-11. I mean, that was just a fact. And you, and you felt it, you felt it in the streets, you know. You, and then wearing the uniform, you felt proud to uh, be a part of that. And, uh, yeah. Lord, yes. I mean, uh, I think back, <clears throat> Roger Collis, these are the guys that meant uh, mentors to me. Uh, once again, going to Old Central, I hate to keep going back to it, but that's where it starts. That's, uh, that's where you formed your good or bad traits and this, that, and the other. Guys like Roger Collis and Raymond, Paul Brown. Uh, oh my goodness, I, I could go on and on, but uh, yeah, the old, the old, the old answer as we call it. Yeah, things that we're doing today. When you set me in front of a camera and a bunch of lights and a bunch of questions. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <God>. Interviews, <laughs> uh, promotional interviews, I had to go through two. The first one I just blew out the water. I mean, I, not good in a good way. You blew it out backwards. I blew it out backwards, right. <laughs> and, uh, uh, yeah, challenges like that. I just, uh, I already explained that, addressed that. Right. Yeah, be fine about it. Losing your good friends uh, when we lost your brother. My daughter and I was going to Washington, D.C. for one of her little school trips. We was going up 29, and there was an entourage, a funeral, that was getting ready to pull into Lakeview. And my daughter, she was uh, 8 or 10 years old, she was asking me the difference in a vault and a casket and a funeral card, this, that, because I had pulled over to let them go by. And I said, honey, it's just a way of showing respect for the deceased. So we were talking about it, and I said, what are we going to do when we get back? I'm going to take you to a funeral home. And uh, it's going to be somebody that neither one of us know, and we can walk in there and softly pay our respects, and you can see a vault, and you can see a person. Little did we know that it was going to be Raymond. We came back from our trip, and uh, my wife come running out to the street, or out to the car, and telling me. And both of my kids uh, fondly referred to Raymond as Uncle Ray. <clears throat> he, <clears throat> hope this is edited out. He would come by and uh, ride them on his tractor <laughs> up and down the street. Super friend, good friend. And I'm sorry, but same way.
Well, Jesse, we went to school together. Everywhere he worked, I worked. We worked at Sears together. We worked at uh, White Oak Mill together. And uh, we were going to join the Marines together. I went and joined. I said, well, I'll go down on my lunch hour and sign up. And you go up on your lunch hour and sign up. Well, I went down, signed up, and I came back. And when Jesse came back, I said, did you sign up? And he had that old... <clears throat> No. I said, what happened? <laughs> I, said, I took my wife, girlfriend at that time, to lunch, and she talked me out of it. I said, you can't talk yourself out of it. I'm gone. I mean, so uh, I was the best man at his wedding, and the preacher said, we got one going for four and one going for life. And so, uh, yeah. But Jesse, Raymond, Roger, uh, just the guys at Old Central, Lord goodness gracious, they were just... You couldn't replace them. You couldn't top them until Chuck Smith come along, and here come this little blonde-headed knothead out of south, out of southern Guilford or eastern Guilford. He was so much like Jesse. I said, "That's where we bonded," and I had me a. He filled a big void for me. One, I think uh, I was nominated and selected to be the fire officer of the year for uh, Greensboro Fire Department. And I'm thinking, well, that's not an accomplishment for me, that's an accomplishment for the men on your company. Because the guys is what makes you, you know, be for the good or bad. And as I said before, I never had a company that I did not like. And I've been blessed to have some of the best men to work under me and over me as anybody in this department. That was my proudest moment. Yes. In fact, uh, one of the assignments to a new captain is to go to the training center and evaluate the rookie class. And Robert Atkins and I were sent out to evaluate, and I remember Chief Hagler <clears throat> getting us before this started. He said, now I want you guys to give me your very, very best, no BS, give me what you think. I don't care how it comes out, I want them to know. So we did. I had half of them and, uh, for the uh, out one, one portion and Robert, and so then we alternated. Coming around, to tell you, told you that, to tell you this, uh, we both had our number ones and number two pick. My number one was uh, uh, Deanne Staley and Pyramid, K. Pyramid. And Robert said, mine too. This is what we're gonna turn into Chief Angler? I said, well, we got the evaluation sheet, we got the checkoff sheet, how they did, what they did. So we went down there after it was over and handed it to him. He said, I knew it, I knew. And took off over to station one, so he knew. So yeah, you know, K. Pyramid and Deanne Clapp, I didn't have them as a employee, I mean, uh, one of my members, but I did get the opportunity to evaluate them, and I'll stand by it. I'll stand by them to this day. They were as good as any of the guys that was in their class, and uh, hey, they were number one and number two. Robert saw the same thing. Chief Hagler concurred with it, so we must have been on right on. Right on. I would do my career all over again. <clears throat> do it all over again, and I don't think there's a thing that I would do differently. I might would give a better look at uh, getting a higher ranking. But in retrospect, I, I'd probably just stay where I was. I, I enjoyed being on the line with the men. Right. Respect is not going to be earned with a badge or nothing like that. You, can, you earn that with your, the way you treat people, the way you want people to, to uh, feel around you to make them feel needed, make them feel a part of the team. I would tell them, listen guys, I'm the weak link on this team here. You guys pull the load. I'm, it goes wrong, it's my fault, but I'm giving you the, the reins to, to, to be your own, to, to, to explore, to, to do it. But no rank, I don't think rank makes, uh, earns you your respect. The computer uh, era, certainly has changed a lot of it. In fact, that was one of the reasons why I got out when I did because I couldn't keep up with it. 
I told her I'd rather do the forms with a paper and pencil than be saddled to a computer and not knowing what to do. In fact, I would give my uh, position to my person on my company that knew how to do the computer. And they would tell me, come on to bed, old man, just stay out of the way, we'll take care of this. And when you feel like you're the weak link on the chain, hey, it's time to, to hurt. My service in the military, one thing, you learn the best and the worst of leaders. And I think it uh, carried over on, onto the fire department. Not that I had a bad leader, but I've heard others talk about things that went on and you think, how in the world can that happen? I mean, you're not supposed to do that if you're a, a leader of, uh, of men. But, uh, and plus it teaches you the, the value of the chain of command. You, uh, is if you can get you a spiral notebook, a little binder or something, and take a note every day of some of the things that happen in your career. Now, I'm not saying this is going to make you successful or not, but you, if you could look back over your career and think of some of the things, and I can't think of the, the, the things, just like be a John Walton, if you will, John Boy Walton, take a little journal and write down some things. Uh, what would make a successful firefighter? Look at what I have done and do right the opposite. <laughs> the person that has made the big impact on me is my present wife, Patricia. Uh, she was there during the last stages of my career and uh, I often wished that it, it, if she could have been there in the, in the other parts of it, you know. There was a lot of stuff that went on that uh, she could have helped me with. And there were some few times in my life that I was... Uh, and in my career, that I, I needed some help. And uh, you're a little too proud, I guess, to ask for it. <clears throat> and so you go to your closest friend, and she was in your experience. The firefighters' wives do play a big role <clears throat> in, in your uh, career. It's hard on them because you were gone. Well, when I was on, you was gone every day. You was either going to work or coming home. And oftentimes, you didn't see them, but just a few hours out of that day. So they had to do the role of taking care of the kids and this, that, and the other. So it takes a very special woman to be a firefighter's wife. Health list. The thing that I would want the Greensboro Fire Department to remember about me would be that <clears throat> I was fair with my people under me that worked under, up for me, if you will, and the, the people that I worked for that I give it my best. And, uh, that I enjoyed my time with them at the fire station when we would go to visit on Sundays. That uh, he, uh, We had a lot of fun and I'm proud that my father was a firefighter. So our Gary Church, Blaine's father, was asking me the other day about the religious the spiritual parts of the fire department, the things that went on, and I was trying to remember the chaplains from the old days and whatnot. But the, the uh, spiritual part of it, uh, it played a big role in the fire service. I mean, you always had your, your, your guys on there that uh, you could go to whenever you needed counseling or to just where you could talk to in privacy and know that everything was you want to stay right there. and uh, Just a way of unloading personal parts of your life with, with some of the guys. And one of them was certainly Gary Church and uh, Roger Collins. They were always, it was like an iron bar. They, they've never bent. A lot of us have uh, moved one way or the other away from our religious teachings, but those two have never, never slept. And I thank them. Sure, I mean, it's going to be, uh, I would like to have been able to look back on the guys before me, that, you know. <clears throat> Henry Farmer, Captain Farmer, he made the landing at Iwo Jima. I would love to sit down and talk to him about that. Hare, another one of my captains, shot down many a times 
and Chief World Harry. War II. Yeah. I'd love to talk to him about these things. <laughs> things of the military <clears throat> that went on. Paul Brown, Normandy, made the landing at Normandy, as did Raymond Reddy, Dewey Kivett. I mean, to be able to do, uh, have a record of these guys and talking about their, their careers. I remember I could listen to, uh, I believe it was a farmer, or maybe it was Hare, when P a Pomona pipe, a big explosion out there, exploded and it mangled bodies. And him, I remember telling him about, and that's probably on the video, reaching and finding one, he grabbed him by the neck bone. I mean, that was all, all that was left of them. I mean, them telling them their war stories. And uh, so we lost a lot of that, but not, <clears throat> having them on record, of course. Uh, but we still have uh, Dewey, and uh, I think we should, uh, I hope you guys get him out. We hope you enjoyed watching these documentaries. It was our goal to share and preserve the memories of our retired Greensboro firefighters. It is our desire that these documentaries will inspire future generations to continue the brotherhood sisterhood, and camaraderie while always striving for excellence in their careers. While fire apparatus, equipment, and technology have improved, several things will always remain the same. The courage and bravery it takes to mitigate natural and man-made disasters will always be a part of the job. Although our retirees are no longer a physical part of the GFD world, a giant piece of each retiree's memories have been shared with you today. These memories will be in their hearts and minds forever. A special thank you goes out to Captain Harold Haney for his many long hours of recording and editing. Thank you, Harold. A job well done. Mm -hmm.